Chris Bishop, who's going to talk about trees, triangles, and tracts, or harmonic measure for short. And uh, uh, Chris, over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen and make sure you can be uh, uh, watching. I'm probably gonna turn off my own video um, just uh, because I'm using my, I'm gonna put my uh, laptop in a tablet mode and the camera will be pointing at the ceiling. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to give this talk. Uh, hopefully it'll be uh, entertaining. I do have to make two apologies. One is to the uh, more senior people who probably have seen a large part of this before. This is very similar to a talk I gave at Lausanne and also for Misha Lubitsch's um, birthday conference a few years ago. Uh, some, some new things I hope you find interesting. And uh, to the junior people, because um, there's hardly any um, definitions or theorems in this talk. There's hopefully a lot of pictures and some ideas, but uh, I, I have not tried to make things extremely precise. And uh, the idea is like we're talking at tea time, except I'm doing all of the talking. And uh, we're just gonna to try to get across a, a few basic ideas. So the first one, uh, the first lecture today doesn't really mention dynamics at all. The, the last slide will, will mention something dynamical, but mostly we're gonna talk about harmonic measure and then talk about trees drawn on the plane, finite trees for, for the first lecture. And then the second lecture, we're gonna talk about infinite trees and then the, what we're doing in the first lecture and then we'll redo it for infinite trees in the second lecture that will have various dynamical implications involving wandering domains and dimensions of Julia sets and, and things like that. So uh, all the dynamical things are really in, in the second part. Uh, Phil gave a very nice talk about harmonic functions and harmonic measure. I wanna give a slightly different uh, perspective on harmonic measure by reminding you what Brownian motion is. So if we have a square grid in the plane, we can do a random walk where you simply choose one of the four random uh, positions to move to at the next stage. And we're allowed to revisit points if we want and uh, so forth. Uh, it's a little boring to watch this. Uh, so let's just jump maybe up to around a hundred or 200 uh, step random walk. I'll uh, go up to a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand. In the limit, uh, a random walk like this converges to a continuous path called Brownian motion. And we're interested in knowing where does the Brownian motion go? Now it's random, so we don't know where any particular path goes, but we are very interested in where does it sort of have a chance of going, what the probability. And usually the way we talk about this is we can find the Brownian motion to some domain. And here I've chosen a polygon, it has around 200 sides. It sort of looks vaguely like, uh, like, like Catalonia. I have to choose a, a piece of the boundary. I'll choose the coastline, mark that in blue. And I have to choose a, uh, an interior point. And what I'm gonna do is start a Brownian motion at this point, and it'll wander around and hit the boundary. And since this point is very close to the ocean, the Mediterranean, probably the Brownian path will most likely hit uh, the ocean. That would be the most likely place for it to go. And so here, oh, that's weird. Okay, so it didn't go to the ocean. It went way over to the other side here. Um, now let's try another one. Well, that one also didn't hit the ocean. Odd. Hmm. The random number generator seems to be playing some tricks this morning. Um, oh, there we are. Okay, well, that one has, has, has hit the Mediterranean like it should. Um, and you notice that I'm accumulating the red dots as to where the Brownian motion hits the Brownian a harmonic measure is the hitting distribution of these random paths on the boundary. So after 10 paths, for example, three of them had hit the blue curve. So my best estimate is that that harmonic measure is three over 10, but I think that's a little bit low. Let me jump up to a hundred. Um, and if I do a hundred such paths, it turns out that 61 of them hit uh, the blue curve, hit, hit, wandered into the ocean. So that seems a little more accurate to me. Now the harmonic measure depends on the base point. So I can move to a different base point here, this is a little bit further away from, from, from the ocean. So I would expect fewer of my particles would, would run into it. Um, let's just take a look. We'll do uh, 10 examples first. And sorry, it's uh, going a little slowly here. And out of our first 10, we hit that piece of the boundary four times. So the harmonic measure from that point looks like it's about 40% or 0.4. Again, we can jump up to 100 
and we get a little lower number, about 34 out of 100. Uh, and this is the intuitive picture of what harmonic measure is. Given a base point, what's the chance that you hit a particular uh, piece of the boundary? Computing harmonic measure by doing these random simulations is very slow. Um, you, you can see it took me a while uh, to do this. I had prepared this one with 100, but this took about uh, maybe a second per, uh, per trial, so about 100 seconds to produce this, which is very, very slow. There's a much faster way of, of computing the harmonic measure. Um, and here are, my, here are the two side-by-side -side comparisons. Um, the faster way is using the Riemann mapping theorem. So hopefully uh, you all know that uh, Riemann mapping theorem says that for any uh, simply connected proper domain of the plane, there's a conformal mapping, a one-to-one -one holomorphic map. And here on the bottom, I have drawn um, an example of this map. I, the various radial lines here go to these different curves. And I've spaced these out separately. So all of these are 1 20th of the circle. So each of these represents 5% of the circle. And the corresponding arcs represent 5% of the harmonic measure. So here around this tip, there's actually one, two, three, four things that hit that tip. So that has about 20% of the harmonic measure right there. Whereas this whole thing is only 5% of the harmonic measure. So Brownian motion really prefers to, to go there. If I uh, have a Brownian motion in the disk and I push it forward by the conformal map, it goes to a Brownian motion uh, in the image. And so the hitting probability transfers. On the circle, the hitting probability is rotationally invariant. So it has to be Lebesgue measure. And in the image, it's the, it's the, it's the harmonic measure. It's the push forward under the conformal mapping. And because we know so much about conformal mappings, we can say quite a bit about um, harmonic measure. So for example, if I wanted to compute uh, the coastline here, the harmonic measure of this piece of the boundary, what I do is I look at the pre-image of this arc under the conformal mapping, and it's this arc here. And that's uh, actually uh, 0.6683%. The, the, the program that computes this will actually compute several decimal places I just put down for. And this took less than a second uh, to do on my, uh, on my desktop. If we move the base point uh, to the other location, do the same calculation, this part of the boundary goes to this smaller arc, which is now about uh, a third, 0.35. And that's the harmonic measure from that point. Um, and here's just a side-by-side -side comparison. So, Oh, and here's a, uh, here's a little uh, cartoon of, of, of Catalan where I've, I've cut it up in equal uh, pieces. You can see that from this piece, all these arcs have equal harmonic measure. So the ones that are sort of close by are short because they have a lots of harmonic measure, whereas down in the corners, it's kind of hard to reach the corners. And so they have the equal harmonic measure. They have to be physically, uh, physically much larger. Okay. So the, as you might've picked up from uh, Phil's talk, the harmonic measure is a harmonic function of the base point. So if you fix the boundary set and let Z wander around its harmonic. And Harnack's inequality then implies that if you start at different base points, uh, you always, the, the harmonic measure of the set is comparable because if you, if you take that harmonic function, a positive harmonic function, any two points has comparable values. So asking whether something has zero measure or not, doesn't matter what the base point is. As long as the base point is on the same side of the curve, if you have a base point inside and a different base point outside, then Harnack doesn't apply because they're in different connected components. And that's a little more interesting question. If we go back to uh, 1916, over 100 years ago, uh, the Reese brothers proved that for rectifiable boundaries, a curve, a, a set of the boundary has positive harmonic measure if only it has positive length. And if you start on the outside, well, on the outside, that boundary is also rectifiable. It's the same exact curve. And so for rectifiable boundaries, the inside and the outside harmonic measures are actually within, uh, are, are mutually continuous. They have exactly the same null sets. Um, this is the kind of problem I worked on when I was a graduate student and a postdoc trying to understand this a little bit better. Um, recently, there's been a lot of progress made. I don't know if uh, Tulsa is here today, but he and others have, uh, have generalized this to higher dimensions. That's not the direction I'm going today, but. It's really remarkable work and worth mentioning. If you don't have rectifiability, I'll just mention, if you have something like a snowflake curve, then the harmonic measures are distinct. They're, they're singular. If you have particles coming in from the outside, they hit one set with probability one, but particles from the inside hit a completely disjoint set. And so the harmonic measures can be um, singular to each other. That's the opposite 
of what I'm going to consider today. What I want to consider today is, is when the inside and the outside harmonic measures are essentially the same. In fact, when can you have a curve so that if you choose a base point on the inside and a base point on the outside, the harmonic measures are, are exactly the same. The chance of being hit from the inside and the chance of getting hit from the outside are precisely the same for every single set, no matter what set you choose, it, it's harmonic measure from the inside and the outside is always the same. That does happen sometimes. If you have a line, for example, and you have symmetrically placed base points, then harmonic measure or the Brownian motions, they're, they're symmetric. If you reflect the Brownian motion, it hits with equal probability. So for a straight line, this is true. And conformally, circles are the same as lines. So it's also true there. If you have a circle and you take points that are radially uh, symmetric with respect to each other, then the chance of hitting uh, a certain set is going to be exactly the same from both sides. And the converse question is, if that happens, does it have to be a circle? Or could something else happen? Um, this probably would have been a good time to take a poll, a Zoom poll, or have you raise your hands. Um, but uh, you just think about that for a second. Uh, the answer is that yes, it has to be a, a circle. I'll just uh, put a, a sketch of the proof of this in here because math talks ought to have some kind of proof and this is the only, only thing that will be close to a proof today. Uh, suppose that we did have some curve which had this wonderful property that it had harmonic measure is the same from both sides. So maybe from here and from uh, here. Uh, what we can do then is we could take conformal maps, which map the origin to the first base point and say map infinity to the second base point. And now we get to rotate our maps. We can, we can if need to, we can pre-compose the rotation so that the point one goes to the same boundary point on both sides. And now what I say is what happens if I take a pre-image of some other point? Well, if I take the pre-image of this, this side has a certain harmonic measure. And so this has to go to a certain point that's determined by that harmonic measure. And on the outside, on the outside, this arc has some harmonic measure and it has to go to some arc that's determined. And under my assumptions, the harmonic measure is the same on both sides. So that point goes exactly to the same place. So this mapping extends to be a continuous across the boundary. But if you're holomorphic on both sides of a circle and continuous, you must be holomorphic in the entire plane. That's Morera's theorem. And if you're, if you're entire and one-to-one -one on the entire plane, you must be linear. That's Leodol's theorem. And so you have, this thing has to be a linear image of the circle. So it is a circle. And so that's the proof for today. That's the, uh, the only thing which I will uh, I'll give carefully. Any questions so far? Are we okay? Am I talking to myself or can anyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Uh, fine. We can I get worried. Thank I, um, you. <laughs> I mean, I've been teaching online and occasionally I realize that, uh, that my internet went out and I didn't know it. Okay. Yeah. And the students do not react. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they have instructions. You know, the first thing I said to them, you know, is always give me at least 10 or 15 minutes to come back. Um, so, and they, they were actually always pretty good, uh, good about that. Okay. okay. Now here's another situation where we have two sides. So I was talking about harmonic measure being the same from the inside of a circle and outside. But suppose I have a tree. So a tree is a, is a planar graph uh, with no loops in it. Uh, probably most of you know that. And I wanna call a tree balanced if a couple of things happen. If I start a Brownian motion out at infinity and it wanders around until it hits the tree, there's a couple of conditions. One is I could say that all the different edges they all have the same harmonic measure, no matter where they are. So they're basically, um, there's n edges. They should each have a harmonic measure one over n. In fact, I'd like to say that when I hit any edge, I can hit it from either side, and those each have harmonic measure one over two n. And even more, even to make it tougher, I'm gonna to say that if I have any subset of an edge, the chance that it gets hit from one side or the chance it gets hit from the other side are equal. It's exactly the same. So there's lots of conditions. All the edges have to have the same harmonic measure when viewed from infinity. And not only that, but both sides have to have the same harmonic measure. And if I take any subset of a side, it has equal chance of being hit from both edges, from both sides. That seems impossible. Okay, that's so many, so many things have to happen there. However, we already saw an example. If you have a line segment, 
and you take a subset, the chance of hitting that from the top or from the bottom is the same by symmetry. So that's an example of one of these are true trees. So this is called, if you can do this, um, let me just back up. This is called the, the true form of the tree or a true tree for short. Okay, so line segment is an example and symmetry gives you some other examples. Um, because there's a rotational symmetry here that you can rotate this, you can also reflect it across an edge. It's not too hard to see that if you're gonna come in and hit a point here, if you reflected the Brownian motion it has an equal chance of coming in and hitting from this side. And if you rotate the whole picture around, you can see that uh, th this is also a true tree. It has a, the right, all the right symmetry properties that we want. But what about if you don't have symmetry? Suppose you have something like this. Well, this turns out to be also uh, one of these balanced trees. Uh, it's not at all obvious, at least not to me, but this edge here, the chance of hitting that is exactly the same from infinity as hitting this edge, even though they, they look uh, different. If I have a particle coming in, the chance that it hits this side of this edge is precisely the same as it hitting this side of this edge. Or if I come in from the other side here, my chance of hitting any segment here is the same on both sides. So I have to explain how I know uh, this picture has this property. So let me uh, do that. Let me first just show you a few other uh, true trees. Um, here are some true drawings of uh, some other things. You notice one of the obvious things is that when you look at this picture, the edges that are on the outside are much smaller. So you usually have some big edges on the, near the center and smaller. That's because when you have one of these random particles coming in, it's much more likely to hit one of these tips. It's a little bit harder for it to sort of come in and come in between the edges and hit further in. So because the Brownian motion is more likely to hit sort of you know, around the convex hull near, near, near the tips of it, those edges have to be smaller uh, you, in the Euclidean metric so that you know, if, they were equal, if I had an edge this size, a big one, it would be much, much more likely to be hit than this edge of the same size further in. So that's what you see. And here, here's a few more pictures that illustrate this. These are some uh, random uh, uh, versions of uh, true trees by uh, Don Marshall and Stefan Roda. And again, you can see that the, the edges on the boundaries tend to be a lot smaller than the ones that are, are, are near the center. Now, how can I uh, create these examples that are not symmetric? So there's two basic uh, ways. And the first way uh, uses a little bit of algebra. So, this might look slightly dynamical because I'm interested in a polynomial and we love to iterate polynomials and I'm interested in the critical values. So that's, the, you look for the places where you have derivative zero and then what value does the function take at that point? And so we know that uh, critical values uh, are very important in, in dynamics and they're also gonna be important in our story as well. And that's not a coincidence. They, they, at the end of the second lecture, you'll, you'll see these things joining up in some way. What I've drawn here, uh, what I'm interested in are, are polynomials that only have two critical values, uh, say plus and minus one. And the, the classical Chebyshev polynomials have this property. Here I've drawn a whole bunch of them, but if I was just to draw one of them, it would sort of look like this. I'm trying to draw one of these paths. And you see there's a critical point here at plus one and one here at minus one. And then all the other ones are the same way. They all look like this, where all the critical values are either at plus one or minus one. So there are uh, uh, plenty of these things, but you could also have them instead. Here, the, the critical values are all scattered on a line or lined up, but they could also occur you know, elsewhere in the plane. You could have a, a sort of a generalized uh, Chebyshev polynomial which, whose critical points were all over the place. Those we generally call uh, Shabbat polynomials for, for George Shabbat, okay? And it turns out that if you take the inverse image of the segment from minus one to plus one, under one of these mappings, you get a tree, and that is a, one of these true trees that has this property. Very roughly, the idea is that if you uh, were to send a Brownian particle in to the segment, it's like equally likely to hit on both sides. And if you take the inverse image, well, P is sort of like a conformal map. It's holomorphic, which is sort of locally conformal. It, it, it's sort of conformal enough that if, if this edge had, would, had pre-images here and you pull these Brownian motions back, they would hit on either side of that with, with equal probability. Uh, to make this a little bit more um, mathematical, a little bit more precise, let me show you the following picture. So the bottom is what I just showed you and what I've added is the top. Suppose that this was a true tree, that the harmonic measure was the same on both sides. I'm gonna draw the conformal map going to the outside of the disc. Now from infinity, 
all these edges have the same harmonic measure. So when I conformally map it, I get a, all the vertices go to points that have equal harmonic measure. But on the circle, equal harmonic measure means equal length. On the circle, Lebesgue measure is harmonic measure. So they just go to equally distributed points. Okay. And now those equally distributed points, if I apply Z to the N to it, they just become two points. Okay. And then there, you apply the, uh, Jar the Jarkowski function, which collapse, conformally collapses the outside of the circle to the outside of the line segment. There's a conformal mapping. And now we have this composition that goes around here. And I claim this is continuous. Um, if you uh, took two points here, one on this side and one on this side, those are going to go up to points here. But their distance to, say, the black edge, if you look at this segment here, it's the same in both of these pictures. So they end up going to pictures which are conjugate of each other, opposite each other. So they get identified in this picture. So if you are have this harmonic measure property and you do this composition, what you are is holomorphic on the outside of the tree and continuous across it. And then again, by Morera's theorem, you must be an entire function, which is an n to one function, because this is the z to the n is n to one and everything else is one to one. And that means you're a polynomial. And the only critical place is the function is one to one every place, except at the vertices, except at the pre-images, the mapping might be two to one or more. So those are the only places you're going to have a critical point. The critical points are, are those pre-images. And so this is basically uh, the proof that, um, that the pre-images of the line segment under these uh, Shabbat polynomials are, are the same as, as true trees. Okay. So that's how we can generate all those pictures. We, we, there's plenty of examples because we just keep writing down more polynomials of this form. Okay. In fact, the, uh, the important thing is that every tree can be written in this way. This is, uh, I say, pretty far from obvious. I mean, it wasn't obvious to me, um, but, uh, but it's a pretty well-known fact. Uh, I'm going to give you two proofs of it. So the standard proof is a uh, use of the uniformization theorem. This says that uh, every compact, simply connected uh, Riemann surface is the usual round Riemann sphere. Okay, so that's the statement which I mean. And uh, what we're going to do is start with any tree that you want, and then take all the vertices and connect them to infinity. And what this does is this triangulates the sphere. So all these edges are all going out to meet infinity. Okay, and so each of these things, this thing here, and this thing here, these are all triangles because they have three edges, right? There's an edge here along the tree, and then there's edges going out here. And now I'm going to form a Riemann surface by replacing each of these sort of topological triangles by an actual equilateral triangle in the plane. That's one on all sides. And I'm going to glue them together along exactly these same edges. Okay. So here's my picture of my uh, 10 triangles. They're supposed to be equilateral. I could not in the plane draw 10 equilateral triangles all meeting at one point. It, it's not, it doesn't fit in the plane. But, but think of these as this way. And then we're identifying the sides in the same pattern. So this side up here gets identified with this side and this side gets identified with this side. And when you do this identification, what you get is a, a topological sphere and it has a conformal structure because each uh, triangle has a conformal structure. And uh, it's pretty clear that if you go across a boundary, uh, you can map that to the plane. And there's a little bit of a trick at the corners, but you have to use power functions, but using power functions, you can define the conformal structure there. And so this is a, a Riemann sphere. And by the uniformization theorem, it's the standard one. And that means that these, these black edges here, they get mapped to some kind of tree on the Riemann sphere. And the point here, you know, basically gets mapped to the point of infinity. And this has the harmonic measure property. Because in this picture, this is obvious that if you start a Brownian motion at the center, the chance of hitting this edge up here is exactly the same as down here and exactly the same as over here because it's so symmetric. And if you have a subset of an edge like this one here, well, the chance of hitting that subset is the same as hitting the symmetric one over here. But those are just the opposite sides when you identify the tree. So it's pretty clear that, um, that this uniformization theorem approach will give you uh, true trees, no matter what tree you started with. Uh, the difficulty with it is we don't really know what this tree looks like. What's its shape? So I'm going to give you a second proof um, to that, that lets you control what the shape looks like. What You can tell, tell what it is. First, 
I'm going to make a few remarks. What I've done here is a starting with a tree, I have taken a bunch of equilateral triangles and glued them together using the geometric information from the tree. And so really what I've done is I've written the, uh, the sphere as, a, as, a, as an equilateral triangulation. And uh, this, is, uh, this is true whenever we have one of these, one of these Shabbat polynomials. Uh, here's a more complicated uh, polynomial drawn on the, well, that doesn't show up too well, over here. And when I connect the vertices out to infinity, I can do the same trick of gluing equilateral triangles together and getting a sphere. And the, the sphere itself, um, so, so what I'm trying to say is, is that this construction extends to more general surfaces, not just the sphere. So if you have like a, a more general Riemann surface of some sort, there's a, there's a similar construction where given a graph on this surface, you can, you, you could do a similar thing. And these, what happens is the Shabbat polynomial is replaced by what are called belly functions. And so these are a holomorphic map of a Riemann surface that has three critical points and usually take them to be uh, minus one, plus one and infinity. And that's exactly what the Shabbat polynomials were. They were, uh, they were maps of the sphere to the sphere that had three critical values at plus one, minus one, and then the one in infinity, which I hadn't really discussed, but every polynomial has a critical point in infinity. And whether you can break the uh, Riemann surface up in, into uh, equilateral triangles or not is exactly equivalent to whether it supports one of these, uh, these holomorphic functions. If you do have such a holomorphic function to the sphere, you can take the, there's an obvious triangulation of the sphere, which is just the upper half plane and the lower half plane. And the, the, the edges, the vertices are at minus one plus one infinity and then the edges are the real line. And when you pull this back, this goes to a, to a, tri a triangle here. And so this is a, so belly functions correspond exactly to, uh, to equilateral triangulations. Now, this is equilateral in the sense of conformal. I mean, these things don't look like Euclidean uh, equilateral triangles. Uh, but they, but in, in a conformal sense, they are. You can tell because the an equilateral triangulation corresponds to uh, having an anti-holomorphic reflection, fixing the edges and swapping the two triangles. So on the plane, this is obvious that when you have the upper and lap, upper and lower half plane, you just have the conjugate function. It swaps the two planes. It fixes the boundary pointwise, and and that's it. It's anti-holomorphic. And so if you took the conjugation and transported it back, what it means is like between these two triangles, there's a holomorphic map that swaps these and keeps the line uh, fixed. And so that property defines what we mean by an equilateral triangulation. Uh, but that's equivalent to taking a whole bunch of Euclidean equilateral triangles and gluing them together to, to form the Riemann surface. Um, now, if you're going to form a compact surface this way, like the sphere, there's only a countable number of ways to do that. Because if you're given a compact surface, that means you're identifying a finite number of triangles. And given a finite number of triangles, there's only a finite number of ways to glue them together that are topologically distinct. So only a, a countable number of compact surfaces have, have this property that there is a belly function on them. Um, which ones do have it? Uh, turns out this was answered by Belli's theorem in the 70s. This happens if and only if the surface is algebraic. That is, you can write it as a, as a as an algebraic curve where the polynomial has algebraic coefficients. I'm not going to get into that uh, uh, at all today. I did want to mention that this was a motivation for growth and deconventing the theory of descendants no fall. Um, could say quite a bit more about that, but that was not, a, not the direction I wanted to go today. Okay. Um, what I wanted to do was sort of aim towards a, a theorem uh, that uh, Lassa Rempa and I had been working on, which is which non compact surfaces. Uh, have this property that you can write them as an equilateral triangulation or equivalently that they have one of these belly functions. And lots of them do. Uh, for example, if you just take the good old plane, everyone knows that you can triangulate the plane with equilateral triangles. That's, uh, that, that, that's pretty evident. Um, you might remember that you can triangulate the disk with equilateral triangles. Now these don't look like Euclidean uh, equilateral triangles, but they do have this reflection property that if I take two triangles bounded by an edge, 
I can reflect them. In this case, it's pretty clear. I can reflect uh, the white triangle to the black triangle in such a way that it's a holomorphic, anti-holomorphic map. And then I could also reflect here and here and here. And now by the group property, this is a, a group in, invariant under Mobius transformations, it turns out that by moving this picture to anywhere else, that those two triangles are related by reflection. And so are those two and those two and those two, they all are. And so this is uh, an example of writing the, the disk as, a, uh, as a, a countable number of equilateral triangles all glued together. That's the conformal structure on it. And you can get other ones as well. Um, this is the punctured disk. It doesn't look like the punctured disk, but the, it's periodic. I mean, the triangulation up here is the same as up here. So if you identify these two sides of the strip, what you get is an infinite cylinder, which is in fact the punctured disk. So the punctured disk uh, can be done in this way. And here is a triangulation of the, of the thrice punctured sphere. That can also be done. So we have lots of examples, but can they all be done or not? Uh, this isn't quite so clear because um, there are infinitely many, uncountably many, um, you know, no, you know Riemann surfaces. I mean, here is just a compact one, but I can sort of stretch it out. And although topologically these are the same, there's a, um, there's um, a, you know, a, you know, a moduli space, which is un, has, you know, which is basically a Euclidean space of some finite dimension. And uh, for non-compact surfaces, it's sort of a, some kind of moduli space of infinite dimension. And whether I can hit all of those uh, with, with, by, with, with my equilateral triangulations is far from clear. In the compact case, you cannot. There are uncountably many compact Riemann surfaces, but only countably many of them are, um, can we have equilateral triangulations? The only hope is that if you have a countably infinite number of triangles put together, then there's uncountably many ways to do the identifications, okay? So you have a countable number of decisions to make. There's an uncountable number of ways you can decide. And so based on a cardinality argument, there's some hope, but uh, it's still not very clear whether you, you should get everything. To do this, what we need is a better proof that true trees exist. So I gave you one with uniformization, but now I want to talk about um, a slightly different way of doing it. So a, several people have mentioned quasi-conformal mappings. Uh, what you can think of these, these are just homeomorphisms of the plane to the plane. Think of them as differentiable, if you like. And they map an ellipse at each point, an infinitesimal ellipse is mapped to a circle. If you want to think about it going the other way, it's small circles mapping to ellipses, that's, that, that's okay too. Um, and the thing about our QC mapping is that the eccentricity is bounded. You can't have things which are arbitrarily narrow and skinny. Okay, so there's some bound on this. What you can think of is that angles here are getting changed a little bit. So something which is a 90 degree angle here, after you map it, it might get changed to something that's not 90 degrees, but it can't get too close to zero and it can't get too close to 180. So the fact that these, these, these ellipses have bounded eccentricity means that angles are sort of quasi-deformed. They can change, but there's a bound on how much angles can change. And in terms of a, a different derivatives, if you uh, have the z derivative of a function and the z bar derivative, and you take the ratio of them, this is called the complex dilatation. And saying that this, you have this, this property about the ellipses is saying that this complex number, this, uh, this dilatation is bounded by one. Okay, and so if you, it takes about a page or two to work out the arithmetic of, of, of these and you have to compute, you know, the partial derivative of F and you have to compute the singular values of the, you know, the linear differential and, but this works out to be the answer that, uh, that you're quasi-conformal if this mu is bounded by one. And the amazing fact, uh, which is, I know Carol mentioned in his talk and perhaps other have, have as well, is that if you're given any measurable function mu that has this bound, it comes from some quasi-conformal mapping of the plane to the plane. And so this is the measurable Riemann mapping theorem. We're only gonna use this in one case, which is illustrated by this picture. Suppose I have a function G, which is quasi-conformal. So it's mapping the plane to the plane and ellipses are getting mapped to circles. And I'm precomposing that by something which is holomorphic. So it takes the ellipse and keeps it as an ellipse. It can change the angle but because it's holomorphic, you know, it doesn't change angles. So the eccentricity ellipse does not change under the holomorphic map. So when I compose these two maps, an ellipse goes to an ellipse goes to a circle. So it's not a holomorphic map. It's not preserving angles. 
The mapping theorem though says I can pre-compose, I can take these ellipses and I can find a mapping H inverse, which maps them to circles. And so then if I reverse H inverse and call it H, then that circle will get mapped to an ellipse, which is set to another ellipse by F, which is then mapped to a circle by G. So circles go to circles. So this composition is a holomorphic mapping. And so the, the, the initial composition, this part is called quasi-regular. Um, it's sort of like a holomorphic mapping, but instead of infinitesimal circles going to circles, ellipses go to circles with this bounded ratio. And the mapping theorem says, well, if you're given any quasi-regular map, you can always fix it by precomposing with a QC map to make it holomorphic. And so this reduces a bunch of constructions to just constructing the quasi-conformal mapping and then sort of fixing it up at the very end. And so this is a very uh, common technique. Uh, one of the names that goes under is quasi-conformal surgery. Uh, this is a method that uh, Kirill was using in his talk. Uh, so lots of people, uh, lot, lots of people use this in, in dynamics, okay? Now we can give our proof that every finite tree has a, a true form. So the proof looks like what we did before. I'm taking a tree and I'm mapping it um, up to a circle by a conformal map. The difference is now that I'm not starting with something which has equal harmonic measures. Different edges can have different harmonic measures. So up on the circle, I could have big arcs and I can have small arcs because there's no reason they have to be the same now. But now I just take a diffeomorphism of the plane which preserves the circle and moves the points around. So this point, maybe I move over here and this point I move over here and I can make them equally spaced by a nice smooth mapping. And so this composition maps the outside of the tree to the outside of the circle with all the vertices going to equally spaced points, except it's no longer a um, conformal mapping. Now it's only quasi-conformal because it's conformal followed by something which is not conformal. But now I'm gonna fill in the rest of this picture exactly the way I did before. I put my Z to the N here, that takes all these points to two points. And then I put my Dworkowski map here and map it down here. And now this composition, is a nice quasi-regular mapping. It's, it's quasi-regular in the plane. It's continuous across the edges just as before. So it's a nice QR mapping of the tree to the line segment. And then the mapping theorem says, I can fill in a box here that makes the whole thing, makes the composition conformal, makes it a, makes it a holomorphic. And it's a one-to-one -one map followed by a one-to-one -one map, followed by an end-to-one -one map, followed by a one-to-one -one map. So it's an n to one entire function. It has to be a polynomial. And so this tree over here is exactly the same tree topologically as this, but it's the pre-image of the line segment under one of these polynomials where the only critical values are at plus and minus one. That's the only place this mapping is not locally one-to-one. -one. And so that's, a, that's another way of proving that every tree can be rewritten as a, as a true tree. And this, this proof is better than the uniformization proof. Um, the reason is, because we draw the tree. So we understand what harmonic measure looks like. We have all kinds of tools involving extremal length and uh, a harmonic measure and hyperbolic metrics. We understand what the distribution of these points are from the tree. We can figure that out. This diffeomorphism, we're choosing ourselves. So we certainly understand it. That means we understand this QC mapping and its dilatation. We, we, we can sort of build it by hand which means when we correct it, when we apply the mapping theorem, the mapping theorem is very constructive. So we can, if you tell me what the mu is, I have lots of ways of estimating what this mapping is. And so this picture, I can make it look the way I want it to look. I have a lot of control over it. It's not something that's just being handed to me by a, by a theorem, I, I can really get my hands on it. And so in particular, um, we can answer a question of uh, Alex Aramenko. Do, do, do true trees approximate all possible shapes? So if I give you some kind of shape in the plane uh, like this, can you find a true tree? Let me use a different color for the tree. So can you find a tree which is kind of uh, has that shape? Looks like that. And the answer is C. Or for the Americans in the audience, yes. All right. So the theorem is that every... Um, Every planar continuum is the limit of true trees in the Hausdorff metric. And Hausdorff uh, metric just means two things are within epsilon if each is within epsilon neighborhood. So if you took 
like this, an epsilon neighborhood would be anything that sort of lay inside an open set that looked something like this. All right. And let me uh, try to sketch the proof of this for you. Okay. If you started with any continuum uh, like this one, I'd like to reduce to just approximating another tree. So what I do is I cover the continuum by boxes, and then I take a spanning tree of that of the box edges. And what that does is that just gives me a nice tree made out of straight line segments, and it epsilon approximates the continuum I started with. So it's enough to approximate this continuum, this tree. Now let me go to the very easiest case, just a, a tree that looks like this. This is not a true tree by itself, because if I send a Brownian particle in from this side and hit this side of the edge, that's much more likely than coming in here and this side, because I'm kind of likely to hit the top or the bottom before I go here. So what I expect is, is that if I take a piece of this edge here, it has a much bigger chance of hitting them from this side, maybe three times bigger than if I hit on this side, because I have to sort of avoid hitting these obstacles to get in here. And I can fix this. I can make this, this side less likely to be hit by adding in some edges like this. Now, if a thing comes in here, it's sort of likely to hit the sides of these and not make it all the way down. The cut down is almost the same as a particle coming here might hit these sides before it hits this. So by adding in little, little edges, spikes like this, I change the combinatorics of the tree, but I make these edges here more like, they're, they're more equally balanced. They're almost the same harmonic measure from both sides. And moreover, I have to check that the new edges I added are also balanced, or at least approximately balanced. If I take an edge here and I come in, say on this side of it, or I come in on the top side, that looks like it's roughly equally likely to be hit because sort of coming in through this gap and this gap is equally likely and turning left or turning right is about equally likely. Now I don't need to get it exact. What I need is I need the new edges that are approximately balanced up to a constant. And then the mapping theorem I can use, I can use the measure on mapping theorem to fix this. There's a certain dilatation I can build. So I can build a, build a certain dilatation that's supported on the neighborhood of the tree. And when I fix this, what I will get is I will get something which is sort of a quasi-conformal image of this and has, is exactly balanced. And so this is something I'm afraid I'm just gonna ask you to take on faith, is that if I can by hand draw a tree which is approximately balanced, so all the edges are up to say a factor of 10 to the 10 balanced from both sides, then I can use uh, the quasi-conformal technology to actually make it a one-to-one -one balance to make them exactly the same. Okay, um, and so this is uh, how you, you, you prove it. Uh, now, the same proof, well, let, let's take a look at this. Let's just take a look at the S by itself. If you send a particle in here, or you send a particle in here, it's more likely to hit on the outside, but you notice there's all these little extra edges coming out on this side. And so each of these, they split up the harmonic measure. So out of each of these dots, it's hard to count, but I think there's six of these little edges coming out of it. So it sort of looks like this. And each of these has equal harmonic measure. So this arc here has the same as all of the arcs on the other side all put together. And there's about seven of them to one. So it's about a seven to one ratio. And similarly here on the E, you can see coming in from this side, all these edges split up the harmonic measure between them, but coming in from the other side, these edges are the only edges. And so you can tell the ratio of likelihood of hitting on one side or the other side by basically counting all these edges have the same harmonic measure. And here there's one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, about, about 10 or 15 of them. And so uh, this is how the, how, how the true tree uh, construction works. Now this doesn't have to just be a tree. The, the, this same construction will work for other shapes. I could have a polynomial or not a polynomial, a polygon rather, which has uh, different edges. And if I map these conformally to a circle, because they have different harmonic measure, they end up going to different length edges. They're not all the same. But I can add on the edges that have too big a harmonic measure. I can block some of the harmonic measure from coming in. And I can let it come into the other edges by not adding any spikes there. And so what I can build is I can build a picture like this, where I've added in decorations, so that all these different segments end up having basically the same harmonic measure. And I only have to do this by hand approximately. So they all approximately have the same harmonic measure. And then I'm going to use, then I get a, a quasi conformal mapping. And then I can you know, sort of pre-compose by QC mapping to get something which is exactly balanced. 
And so, um, so what I can build is I can build uh, a functions which are quasi regular on the outside of a shape. And each of these segments gets mapped to a segment over here, which then gets mapped to the segment minus one to plus one. Okay. And so this is something I know how to, how to do very well. Now, I just want to invert this picture. Here I have infinity mapping to infinity, but I want to take a point inside and map it to infinity. And so that picture is, is going to look like this. So I take a, 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 take a shape, some nice polygon. I'm going to add some edges to it or some, add some vertices to cut it up. And I have a base point. And now what I'm going to do is uh, I can draw these edges here so that all of these edges have exactly the same harmonic measure from this point, okay? And so this is the, uh, this is the folding construction. This is an example of what we call folding. And so what happens is that this point here gets mapped to infinity. The blue section gets mapped to the blue section and it all gets collapsed down to this. And so what I have here is I have a meromorphic function that has a pole in the middle and every edge here maps to plus or minus one. And the, the great thing is if I take another piece over here and I take that point going to infinity and I can draw these edges here, then on both sides of this edge, they both match go the plus and minus one and they match up. I can form a continuous function so I can extend this. I can tile the plane with patches and define a meromorphic function on each one and they all match up. Now these are all quasi-regular, but when I'm all finished, I can use the measurable real mapping theorem to give myself a real, a holomorphic or a meromorphic function, okay? Now, this is most exciting um, when I do this, oh, one final remark. Um, the dilatation for this quasi conformal mapping is, 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 is supported on a neighborhood of these trees I add. So in this case, it would be supported on a, uh, a neighborhood like this, pretty big, thick neighborhood. But I could fix that if I took my points very, close to each other. And then when I add on my spikes and my little trees, they're all pretty close to the boundary. And in this case, sorry, wrong color. In this case, the, um, the dilatation, the place where the thing is not conformal is a smaller neighborhood. So what always happens is that the dilatation is supported on a neighborhood whose thickness is approximately comparable to the distance between these points. And so by making these points very close together and making the spikes very, very short, my quasi-regular mappings are actually holomorphic or meromorphic on most of the center, and they're only not holomorphic on a very thin neighborhood of the boundary. Now, as I said, the, the most fun place to do this is on a Riemann surface, not in the plane. So suppose you have a compact Riemann surface, and I cut it up, I tile it somehow into uh, to pieces like this, um, and then I'm gonna take each of these tiles and do the construction I just mentioned. I'm gonna put dots on it, and then I'm gonna add in my little trees to make it all the edges have equal harmonic measure. Um, and I'm gonna build my quasi-regular mapping on this piece. And then I can do the same thing and do it on this piece. So there's a pull at the white dot and I can put a white dot here and then I can do it over here, put a pole there and put some points along the edges here. And what I can do is I can build a quasi-regular mapping, which only has three um, critical values because all the dots here, all the vertices are going to plus one or minus one on the sphere. And the poles, the white dots, they're going to infinity. And so what I'm building is a quasi-regular belly function, something which, which, which is exactly what I want, except it's quasi-regular. Now I can solve the, the, the Beltrami equation. I can use the measurable real mapping theorem to fix this and make this holomorphic. When I do that, though, I change the conformal structure of the, of the Riemann sphere or of, of the Riemann surface. When you're doing this on the, on the sphere of the plane, that's no big deal because when you change the conformal structure of the plane, it's still the plane. The plane is unique. It doesn't have more than one conformal structure. It only has one. So if you change it, it has to be the same thing over again. There's no choice. But a Riemann sphere can have many conformal structures. So when I solve the Beltrami equation to make a quasi, to make a holomorphic or meromorphic function, it ends up being defined on a slightly different Riemann surface than the one I started with. Topologically the same, but meromorphically different. And so all we can prove is that belly surfaces are dense in, um, in all compact surfaces. And in fact, 
We already know that because we know that the, 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 the compact surfaces, there can only be countably many of them that have such a function on them. So even though we can build our quasi-regular map on any compact surface whatsoever, it doesn't make any difference. Once we solve the equation to make it meromorphic, it lands on one of these countable number of, uh, of surfaces. Now, the thing I mentioned was we wanted to also do uh, non-compact surfaces. So think of this surface as just going on here forever. And we handle it one compact piece at a time. So I take a compact piece of this surface and just let me separate that out for a minute. And on this surface, I am going to cut it up into tiles. And then on these tiles, I'm going to put my poles and I'm gonna put my little decorations. I'm gonna make a QR belly function. And when I solve the Beltrami equation, I get a holomorphic or a meromorphic belly function on this piece, but it's not the same looking piece. It, the, the conformal structure changes. It's not the same piece anymore. And so it's not obvious that this piece fits in the Riemann surface I started with. And the key is the whole secret, the thing that makes life great is that it does fit in. That if you take a compact piece of a Riemann surface and you change the conformal structure ever so slightly just by epsilon change, the new piece will embed in the old piece slightly differently. So the boundary changes. If you take this one boundary and you perturb it, you can actually sweep out a whole neighborhood of the moduli space. And so even though we changed the conformal structure on this compact piece, if it's a small enough change and we get to control how small it is, that's, you know, we get to build it, we can make it as small as we want, we can get that piece to re-embed in the re original Riemann surface. That's something you cannot do in the compact case because you don't have any space. We're sort of somehow pushing the problem over a little bit. Well, now we take another compact piece and we play the same trick and it re-embeds in the same Riemann surface. And then we take another compact piece and we build our QR function on this and we solve the equation and it re-embeds slightly differently in the same Riemann surface. And now you just keep going. And what you prove is that every non-compact surface does have a belly function or equivalently, every non-compact surface uh, can be obtained by equilateral triangulations. One corollary of this I'm rather fond of is that in particular, this implies that every Riemann surface is a branched cover of the sphere because we just proved that every non-compact surface is a branch cover with at most three branch points, okay? And it was already known that this is true for all compact surfaces. That's something called the riemann rock theorem, that every compact surface has a meromorphic function and on a compact surface, there can only be finitely many branch points. So uh, as far as I know, this is a new result. It was not previously known that all, uh, every Riemann surface was a branch cover with only three, with only finitely many branch points. So that's kind of a nice, uh, nice statement that uh, we were able to prove. I've promised you one final slide on dynamics, and this is it. I've gone over a little bit. Hopefully you won't yell at me. Um, one case of a Riemann surface that's non-compact is any open set in the plane. What it means is that any open set in the plane has one of these three branched covers of the sphere. And this turns out to be one of Adam's uh, finite type holomorphic mappings. And so this turns into a dynamical system because you can take a point and iterate it um, using this map. Eventually it might land outside the open set in which case you stop and say, well, that's gonna be a for two point. But the Julia set will be all the points which, which stay inside uh, the, the open set forever and do not form a normal family. And so this gives lots of new, uh, lots of new dynamical systems on, on, on open sets of the, the sphere. And in particular, I, I mean, I don't know anything about any of these. Um, you know, for example, escaping points. Well, points can escape in a finite number of steps if they land outside. But if they land inside, there's maybe uncountably many different boundary components they might go to. Or maybe they go to some of these, but not others. I think that there's a whole bunch of questions we could ask uh, that, uh, that maybe we couldn't ask before. And so there, uh, thank you for your patience and uh, I'm willing to quit and uh, take questions for now. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, okay. If you, so if you need more time. No, I just, uh, I was running through my slides because sometimes uh, the, the PDF reader is not, um, is a little slow in opening the file. So I wanted to run through it one time so that every slide was pre-opened. It was uh, in the RAM instead of being on the disk. Um, okay.
Well, I can begin whenever you're ready. Well, uh, then by all means, go ahead, Chris. Um, the second all right. Half. Looking okay, well, I apologize for that terrible talk you just heard, but now we're gonna have a good one. That's terrific. Okay, so we're hopefully we'll, we'll finish stronger than, than we started. So let me um, uh, share uh, my screen again. And now can you see the, the new uh, uh, title page? We can. Okay, so I wanted to uh, begin this one with a break. Well, we just had a break, but we're gonna have another break. It's sort of a story. I was wanna tell you uh, a little bit, uh, since we're in Barcelona, let me, um, I'm just making a little correction here. Uh, tell you a little about, about uh, Gaudi, a famous architect and artist, has big cultural influence. If you're in Barcelona, you certainly recognize uh, some of his work, uh, such as the uh, Basilica of the Holy Family. Uh, I wanted to, to tell you about his contributions to, uh, uh, to um, geometric uh, function theory and uh, quasi conformal mappings. So this is a lesser known aspect of Gaudi's work, um, but it was uh, told to me by uh, Dennis Sullivan, who I mentioned to him recently that I was going to be in, um, in Barcelona, or at least online. And so he had visited Barcelona, he told me in the eighties, although I can't find anyone in Barcelona who seems to remember him being there. So if, if you remember him being there around 1985 or 86, let me know. Uh, he had uh, visited Barcelona and was captivated by the tilings, these mosaics uh, that are all over. And so I'm trying to show a few of them. Uh, this is a little fuzzy on my screen. Let me, uh, I'm sorry, let me uh, start over again here. Okay, so uh, Dennis was walking around and he was looking at these tilings and he was inspired by them that he wanted to come up with a mathematical theorem about the tilings. He wanted to speak with them. So he told me the tiles made me want to talk about them. So I had to find something mathematical to say uh, related to these Gaudi tilings. This is what he came up with. So um, you start with a, a grid in the plane. So this is basically looks like the, the regular square grid, except you allow the, the pieces to be curved. And you nest this in a finer one. So what we're basically doing is we're taking this and then we're dividing it up and making it a, a finer. We would take an infinite sequence of these things going down, okay? So then choose a point at random. Just take your point pin and put it down somewhere randomly in the plane. And what you think of is you're going to take neighborhoods of this and blow them up. So you take a little epsilon neighborhood and blow it up to unit size. And your grids, your very, very fine grid blows up to something uh, of, it becomes a new grid of larger and larger size. So what you do is you take a point, you look at these infinitely many grids you have going down to it and you blow it up. And when you blow it up in the limit, you get a lattice. And that's what Dennis proved is that whenever you have uh, the, the sequence of, 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 of nested uh, 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 quadrilateral meshes in the limit, all of them look like parallelograms. They have to. Uh, for those of you who know about quasi conformal mappings, the reason is because if you have one of these grids that's curved, you can map it quasi conformally to a square grid. Okay, the combinatorics are all correct. And now when you zoom in, what you have is a, a quasi-conformal mapping and quasi-conformal mappings are differentiable almost everywhere. So when you zoom in at a point of differentiability, the square grid goes over to a parallelogram grid because the mapping is differentiable. And so that's how he, he proved this thing. And so he, uh, I, he gave a talk at this, he told me in Barcelona and he certainly gave one at Columbia uh, later on. And uh, so it was kind of uh, inspirational to him. And so we can, I think, Things say that Gaudi had also made some contributions to, to mathematics as well. Has he ever Was there a question? Has he ever published this? No, he told me he had never published this. So this is an unpublished paper of Gaudi and Sullivan. Um, I, I was inspired by, by Dennis's story. So I made a, uh, a mosaic of him. Um, this one is not very clear. You have to squint your eyes quite a bit. It only has a thousand tiles in it. But if you uh, increase it to 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000, I think you can see Dennis a little bit more clearly in, in this mosaic. So if, uh, so if Barcelona needs any more uh, uh, mosaic tilings around the city, uh, here's one you might, you might wanna use near the math department. 
Okay. So now back to work. So uh, in the last talk, we saw that every uh, finite planar tree has a true form. And every tree can be approximated uh, by one of these true trees that has the balanced uh, harmonic measures. And what I wanna talk about today is um, infinite trees in the plane. So things that sort of go on forever, right? And first of all, I have to say, well, what does the true form mean? And then what's the approximation theorem? And then what is it good for? And the applications are basically to dynamics, transcendental dynamics. And so we will have a, a little bit of that in today's talk. Now, in the finite case, we had um, a, 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 a finite tree sort of looks like this. And the complement of a finite tree is just one component, just one unbounded component that surrounds it. But when you have an infinite tree, it can cut the plane up into several components, okay? And unlike the finite tree, which you have a sort of an annular component on the outside, all of these components are simply connected. So the topological setup is a little bit different. But that's all. I mean, it doesn't really make, take very much to change the picture. This is the picture I showed you last time. When you had a finite tree, we mapped it conformally to the outside of the disk, and then we applied z to the n, and then we map back, and the composition of these things was a polynomial. Now, what we only have to change the left side of the picture here. And what happens is that when you have an infinite tree, each of the complementary components is simply connected. So instead of mapping it to the outside of the disk, I map it to the right half plane. So whenever you have a simply connected domain, I can map it to the right half plane so that the point in infinity is still going out to infinity. And then to map the outside, to map the right half plane to the outside of the disk, I use the exponential function instead of z to the n. So I'm just replacing. That's basically the only change is this corner, that this corner is becoming a half plane and the, the z to the n. I still have the Dworkowski map here. I still take the outside of the disk down to the segment. Uh, but now the exponential map composed with that already has a name. That's the, the hyperbolic cosine, that's the cosh. And so I'll often refer to the cosh, but in, for purposes of this talk, the exponential function and the cosh function are essentially the same. They both map the half plane to the complement of some compact set. In one case, it's the disk, and in one case, it's the line segment. But if you're very far out, if you're far away from the origin, basically the maps are doing the same thing. Just to remind you, um, the exponential map and the cosh do play an important role in this, in this talk. So I wanna remind you exactly how they work. Um, these things, they take a vertical segment here and map this to, the, cir to um, the circle. And then the horizontal edges get mapped out here. And then the exponential function takes this strip to the rest of the plane. And then you just define it by reflection over the rest of it. And the picture for the cosh is basically the same, except the uh, vertical edge here is mapped to this line segment. And then these segments go off to infinity this way. And then the strip is mapped here. Okay. So this is a picture you, you might want to keep in mind. Several times I'm going to show a picture of, I'm going to map the inside of a strip to a half plane. And I want you to have this picture in mind that when I, I'm doing this, this is what's this is what's going on, okay? Is that is that kind of clear? Okay. Um, now that's what a true tree means. So, the, so what, what a true tree means? I mean, I, me, I didn't say this explicitly, but having a true tree means that when you map these complementary components to the half plane, that each of these edges goes to equally spaced intervals here. So, the, the tree has a true form if that's what happens, okay? So for the finite tree, the edges had to go to equally spaced things on a disk. And in the infinite case, they have to go to equally spaced intervals on the half plane. That's the only difference, okay? So sorry, I didn't make that more clear uh, the first time we looked at that slide. Now to state the approximation theorem in the plane, I said that any continuum could be approximated by a, a true tree. That's not quite going to be the case here. So we need some hypotheses which substitute for the finiteness, for the compactness, okay? So um, we're gonna modify what we mean by the Hausdorff metric. And then finite trees have what we call bounded geometry and a tau lower bound automatically because they're finite. Well, for infinite trees, this is something we have to assume separately. So let me explain all of these things. Um, 
So if you just have a one line segment, um, a house dwarf neighborhood of it is just everything which is within epsilon of that. But I want to sort of scale it to the size. So what I want is given a line segment of some length, I want to take a neighborhood which is of comparable size. I'm taking all the points which are within R times the diameter. So if I took a smaller edge, it would have a smaller neighborhood and a bigger edge would have a bigger neighborhood. So it sort of scales with the size. And when I have a tree, I can define a neighborhood of the tree by taking one of these neighborhoods for each of its edges. And for short edges, of course, that neighborhood is smaller and it's bigger for a big edge. So this is kind of a Hausdorff neighborhood of, of a tree, which is adapted to the local size of the edges. And this turns out to be a more useful uh, thing for us. It does have a nice property that if you add extra edges to the tree, these neighborhoods get smaller. And so you can shrink one of these neighborhoods by adding vertices. And so here's an example of that where I've added extra vertices and this neighborhood shrinks down a little bit. Okay, so this I will refer to if T is a tree, T of R is this neighborhood where R is the factor of, of how comparable the, the neighborhoods are, okay? Usually we're just gonna take R to be about one. So it's going to be a, roughly a neighborhood as thick as the edges, okay? Now, another property, which is automatic for finite trees, but not automatic in general is bounded geometry. So I'm going to assume all my trees are made out of edges. Basically all the examples I'm gonna show you, they're either straight edges or circular arcs. Um, but in general, we need some kind of smoothness, like at least C2 with some uniform bounds, okay? For some results, it's nice to assume they're analytic uh, curves, but I don't think that's coming up today. When edges meet, I want them to meet with sort of large angles. And so the way I say that is that the edges form a bi Lipschitz image of a star. A star is when you have equal angles meeting together. And bounded geometry also means that the number of edges coming together is going to be bounded. So we're not going to have, we're going to have an upper bound on the degrees of the, the vertex. The second condition is that non-adjacent edges are, are well separated. You cannot have two edges which are very, very long and very, very close together. That's not allowed. If you have two edges which don't meet and you take these uh, Hausdorff neighborhoods of them, one of them has to be outside the neighborhood of the other one. So they cannot, uh, be very close to each other. This is sort of a, an, an extremal length condition. It says that the modulus of the path family that separates the edges is bounded. It's bounded away from uh, a zero. We're bounded away from infinity, whichever one is, is correct. So this is sort of a quasi, this sort of has a quasi conformal feel to it. The other condition uh, is that there's a smallest edge. Now in a finite tree, there's only finitely many edges. So there's obviously a smallest one. But for an infinite tree, there doesn't have to be a smallest edge. They could be arbitrarily small. So we're basically gonna put a lower bound on the edge sizes. And we do this in a conformal way that when we take one of these complementary components and map it to a half plane, they, if it's not a balanced tree, these, these edges can map to things of different lengths, but we're assuming that it's bounded below. And we usually assume it's bounded below by pi. If it's not, if it's bounded below by 10 to the minus five, then just multiply z goes by z times 10 to the fifth. Just expand half plane and then you can get uh, pi. I guess I need a times pi here. Um, usually you just need some lower bound. And both of these are things that are automatic for finite trees, but it's the part of finiteness that we need to assume in, in the general that we have these two conditions. If you have a strip, for example, I could add in vertices like this, evenly spaced, along the edges and then the bounded geometry is kind of obvious because everything is nice straight edges. At worst, the angles are 90 or 120. If I have two edges that are not adjacent, they're well separated from each other, everything is terrific. If I take these, the, the, these points and I map to the upper half, to the right half plane, the mapping is roughly e to the z. So these unit spaces actually become huge as I move out down the strip, the spacing of these edges becomes larger and larger. So there is a lower bound. Basically this edge is the, the worst edge. Those are the, the worst edge. The outside of the strip though is terrible, okay? When you map the outside of the strip to here, it's roughly like square root of z, which means the other map coming back looks like z squared. So if you take a unit segment, which is very high up, it maps to something that's length about n. And if you take something down here, which is a unit segment, it maps to something of length about n, 
And then what you have are two segments of length n, which are only distance one apart. That's not bounded geometry. So this is an example where you do not have uh, the, the condition holding. And so this is sort of our enemy. The problem here is that the complementary component here is too big. It's, it's wider than a half plane. So when you map it to a half plane, it compresses. All of our components, we want trees so that each of the complementary components is thinner than a half plane when you go to infinity. So it's like a, a sector of less than 180 degrees. That's what the tau condition is really saying. And if you have both these conditions, if you have the bounded geometry, and if you have the tau lower length, then you can do the approximation. And the technical way of saying this is that you define a function which you take the complement of the tree and map it conformally to the half plane, then you follow it by the cosh to map it into the, um, into the uh, complement of the line segment. All the, the, the tree edges then, all these edges map to the segment here, they map onto the segment. And, but they don't have to be continuous. If you take a, a, if you come in here and you come in here, and then those points maybe go here and here, they could end up mapping to different points here. It, there could be a jump discontinuity for, for this conformal mapping. And what the folding theorem says is that you can fix that by, by, by modifying the map in this neighborhood, in this modified Hausdorff neighborhood, you can find a quasi-regular map in which everything matches up and it's continuous. Okay, and so um, basically you're saying you can take this holomorphic mapping given by the conformal map and make it quasi-regular, make it continuous, and then you can get an entire function by solving the Beltrami equation by getting a, a quasi-conformal mapping. So you take this quasi-regular thing, the folding theorem gives you, and then you can compose it with a, a, a fixing map. And then when you, you, you fix it, you get an entire uh, mapping. And in many, 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 many applications, this dilatation is very close to the identity. And so the, the entire function you get is almost the same as the quasi-regular function you build. And so what you get is a, a, a entire function f whose pre-image is not quite this tree, but it's kind of, it's very similar to it. So it's a perturbation of it, okay? And so this is the, this is the approximation theorem. It says that if you're given a tree that has these two uh, geometry conditions that, you know, the edges are basically bounded geometry that, you know, there's not radical, as you move from one edge to another edge of the tree, things don't change too much. The sizes don't change too radically. The angles are not too bad, all of that. Then there's actually an entire function that has only two critical values, plus and minus one, so that that tree is approximately the pre-image of F. Um, let me show you an example where this works out pretty easily. Uh, here is a, an infinite tree in the plane. It's made up of a bunch of things that are basically half strips. And there's one thing here which is, looks like a half strip except that it's getting narrower as you go out here. So it's becoming thinner. But it's pretty easy to check that this has bounded geometry. That condition is always easy to check. All the angles are 180 or 90. All the edges I've drawn have comparable sizes to their neighbors. Even over here, when I'm going out to infinity, I'm putting these points so that, you know, adjacent edges are about the same size and they're shorter than the distance between it. So when I take an edge over here and an edge on the top, they're not too close to each other. So this is bounded geometry. It also has the tau lower bound because mostly you're taking half strips and mapping them to the half plane. So remember when you take a half strip and map it to a half plane, that's basically exponential. And so evenly spaced points go to things which are exponentially spaced. So the spacing expands. And so the tau lower bound also holds. So there's a entire function that has two critical values. And on each of these components, it basically looks like the conformal mapping to a half plane followed by, um, by the exponential map. And uh, the, the, the neat thing about this is that if you take the function in this one component, which is getting narrower and narrower, because this thing is getting narrower, when you map it to a half plane, it expands as fast as you want. And if you make this thing narrower, you can make this mapping expand as quickly as you want. So you can find a function which grows along the real line as quickly as you want. Um, now, this is something that was already uh, known uh, to Sergey Marenkov a few years ago um, with, with one extra singular value. And so it's not really a, a brand new application of folding, but it, what it, it's one of the simplest examples that you can sort of see how you can build a bounded geometry tree 
And from this, you get an entire function. The entire function has the property you want. Now, one little technical point is, is that the quasi-regular mapping is growing along the real line as fast as I want. There's this singular, there's this correction, the, 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 uh, the one that comes from solving the Beltrami, that's always the thing you have to worry about. Does it change the property? But, but my quasi-control mappings are holder. They, they're basically like a power at worst. And if I can make this grow as fast as I want and then slow it down by a power, it's still growing as fast as I want. So in this case, going from the quasi-regular model to the actual entire function doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt at all, okay? Um, let me tell you a little bit about the proof of this. Um, the difficulty is that we don't have continuity, that if I take two points on opposite edges of the tree, they could end up not matching. Now, they're not very far off. I mean, they're only about two. So you could think of various different ways that you could interpolate uh, between these uh, using a D-bar equation or, you know, using, there, there's various ways you could try to try to close this gap down. Most of these ways, though, don't give you really great control over the singular values. We have exactly two singular values, plus and minus one. And if I just start doing things like taking phi times f plus, like maybe I take a convex combination of two functions, I, I lose control of the derivatives and I don't know about the critical points anymore. But let me tell you the mental picture of what you want to do. Uh, imagine uh, you have two uh, tubes you want to join together. Maybe you have your summer shorts uh, for wearing, but it's winter now and you want to make them into long pants. You know, so you, uh, you want to add on some material to it. You know, turn your, your, your short pants into long pants. The trouble is the tube you want to add isn't the same size as the tube you're, you're connecting with. So how do you join these together? And the secret is pretty simple. The same thing that you would do if you were sewing. You would take the larger piece and you would identify certain points on it to each other and you would identify them and put them together like this. You would form a pleat. And then what's left over is exactly the same size as what you have and you join them together. This is what quasi-conformable folding does for functions. This is all it does, is you're trying to join two things which somehow have different sizes and you introduce a singular point that somehow eats up some of the length on the bigger one. And what's left over, you can do the gluing exactly the way you want. In quasi-conformal surgery, uh, classically, we often try to avoid the singularities. We try to, to um, do the gluings in regions where the mappings are smooth. And in folding, quasi-conformal folding, the difference is that we introduce singularities on purpose. So it's sort of singularities for fun and profit. We're going to make uh, we're going to introduce singular points in order to make things which don't want to be joined together to join together. So we're sort of changing the topology that's going on in order to, to make the, the gluing possible. In reality, in, in gluing, uh, in, in quasi-conformal welding, what we actually do is that we introduce singularities on both sides and we reduce them down to some common size and then do the gluing on the common size. This is why the tau condition is, comes in technically. I wanted to assume that in my trees, there was sort of a shortest edge. And it's exactly for this purpose that when we're doing this kind of procedure in the gluing, in, in the more technical thing for functions, everything gets reduced to that smallest edge and then the gluing occurs on that smallest scale. And so there's sort of very good technical reasons why you have to do that. Um, but that's the, the, the picture here. Let me try to run through what this looks like for actual functions, not for pieces of cloth. Um, here I have the plane and I have two functions. I have cosh z and cosh three z. And so this is basically an entire function on the whole plane, except for the fact that it's not continuous when you cross over here. Um, there's no way of, of, of making uh, a function which is equal to cosh z on one side and cosh three z on the other side because you need continuation. The only way to analytically continue cosh across here is as itself, not as, as somebody else. But what we can do is we can add a strip. And what we can do is build a quasi-regular mapping, which is the cosh over here and is three cosh over here and interpolates in between them in just the way that I described with the gluing the tubes together. And what we do is we're gonna use triangles. So I'm gonna introduce some spikes. Remember the finite trees? We added spikes to them. We're doing the same thing here. We're adding spikes in our strip. And then what I'm going to do is triangulate each of these, okay? Now, when I have a triangulation, I can draw another picture 
And there's an obvious way to map this triangle to this triangle. You take the three vertices and map them to the three vertices, and that defines a linear map of the simplex. It defines a linear map of the triangles. So in the next picture, what I'm going to show you is uh, two triangulations. Here's one, and here's one. And combinatorially, these are the same triangulations. This triangle is the same as here. And then there's a triangle next to it, which goes over here. And that triangle goes to the middle one. And this one goes over here. And this one goes over here. And so this defines a linear mapping on each triangle going from there to there. And linear maps are quasi-conformal because if you have a linear map, its dilatation is bounded by some number and there's only a finite number of triangles. So I just take the worst one and that gives me my dilatation for the map. And then this picture is replicated you know, in all the other, this is a periodic picture. This just gets replicated everywhere else, okay? And now this has done what we want. If you sit down and check it, I don't know if it's obvious just looking at this, but what this mapping does, if you take this composition, then along uh, this edge, what happens is that um, it's equal uh, to cosh Z. And along the other edge, this mapping is equal to cosh 3Z because it has this three to one property. So here you have three dots. And over here, that maps to a figure like this. And this edge maps to this. And this edge maps, this is the folding. Actually, the folding is going this direction, going left to right is unfolding the thing. And so what this gives you is a quasi-regular mapping, which is cosh Z in the left plane, cosh 3Z in the right, and then we've done this interpolation in the side. And this works always, except in a more general tree like this, it's a bunch more complicated. Okay, that's all there is. I mean, uh, basically what we want to do here is if you map to this to a half plane, for example, this side and this side, might end up mapping to things which are very long here and very short here. So the conformal mapping of the complement might take these two equal edges to things that are different sides. And so the long one, the thing that's longer, I need to break it up. And the way I break that up is I'm gonna sort of add on some spikes on this side. And so then this thing gets mapped to this. So this thing gets maybe broken up into 10 pieces and these 10 pieces get sent here. And this side just gets sent to that side with no folding in it at all. And so it's by introducing this folding and this folding introduces critical points at the tips of these things where I'm basically has a map that looks like Z squared. By introducing the, the, these foldings, what I can do is I can um, basically make this long interval look like it's the same length as this by, by doing this folding trick, okay? Now, there's a bunch of technicalities. I'm sorry, if you read the paper, it's kind of uh, long and technical and there's a bunch of things. Uh, one of the, you know, since you're, you know, this is a mini course, I just tell you one of the technicalities is, suppose that we had a huge mismatch. Suppose that this length here was like one and this one was like 10 to the five. So over here I have one and over here I have 10 to the five, okay? In order to make this match up correctly, what I'm going to have to do with the spikes is make them quite long. They sort of get longer depending on what this ratio is. And this causes a problem. If these spikes have to be so long that they're much, much longer than this arc, it's then going to be hard to fit in spikes from other edges as well. It's, it's going to be a mess. What I want to do is keep all the spikes basically controlled by the length of the edges they're attached to. I don't want to make them longer than the edges. And for this, instead of going to spikes, we go to a, a combinatorially different tree. Instead of adding on things that just look like this, what we add on are pictures like this. And what you can do here is I'm adding on a tree, but if I have a Brownian particle coming in and it wants to reach this edge, it has to go through this little gap. And by making you know, this gap, notice it's getting shorter and shorter, I can make it harder and harder to reach this edge but the height here is always staying comparable to the length. And so technically uh, in the folding theorem, instead of adding on little spikes, which you can do in the finite case and the infinite case to maintain control of the quasi constants, you end up adding more elaborate decorations. And there are pages and pages and pages of pictures like this and showing you how to, uh, 
how to add them on. And if you want to join a decoration like this to this, you have to do some trimming of it and you have to you know, do some combinatorial things. And it, 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 I admit it, it's a bit messy. So someone is very welcome to come along and uh, write down the better, beautiful, elegant version of this. Um, the second thing I should tell you before getting to the examples, uh, the applications, is that what I was telling you about were maps of the components to the right half plane. And so these are the things I call R for right half plane. You could also map a component to a left half plane. And then when you exponentiate it, instead of blowing up to infinity, it goes to zero. And so in, in certain components, you instead of making the function blow up to infinity, you can make it go down to zero. That creates what's called an asymptotic value. You can also create bounded components in which the mapping looks like a Z to the N. So basically you're creating a, a high power critical point in there. And for many of the dynamical applications, you have to use these other um, uh, things. So they're also built in to the, to the more generalized folding theorem. I will not say a huge amount about it. I'm just hoping that if I look honest, you will believe me that it, it works out. Uh, but this is, um, this is how it goes. And so um, in the last couple of years, we have used folding to, you, to do a bunch of different things. So it's resolved a, a, a couple of different problems. Um, the ones that really have to do with, 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 um, with, with, with dynamics that I want to talk about today are wandering domains, which other people have spoken about. And I want to talk about the Hausdorff dimension of Julia sets. And I want to talk about a, a result of uh, myself and Kirill, uh, mostly Kirill, uh, about post-singular dynamics. And I think I can spend about five minutes or so um, on each of these topics. Before I launch into that, are there questions? I've been going pretty quickly, and you've been pretty quiet. It's been worrying me. I was expecting that there would be lots and lots and lots of interruptions. Uh, what is Wieman conjecture? Something... The Wieman conjecture, I was not going to talk about today, but, yes, uh, but what is it? this is something that was actually solved by Heyman. So it has to do with the maximum and the minimum modulus. So when you... Um, okay, okay, so, I understand. <laughs> so let me, for everyone else, let me just say, when you have e to the z, e to the z is an interesting function. If you take the maximum modulus between on the circle of radius r, well, it looks the maximum modulus looks like e to the r, and the minimum modulus looks like e to the minus r, which happen to be reciprocals of each other, okay? And the, the Weinman's conjecture was, you know, does that always hold? Is it always true for an entire function that, that basically, you know, there's some reciprocal connection between the maximum and the minimum modulus. Now you have to account for the fact that the minimum modulus could be zero, but there's a well-formed conjecture which was disproven by Heyman, I think around 1950. But um, you can use folding to construct a counterexample where there's only two critical points. And so uh, that's, that's one of the things that's discussed in my paper, but uh, it's not a dynamical thing. I, it's not one I chose to describe today. Um, if you like, I can pull up some slides. Uh, I, I, understood, I understood what we're talking about. I, I, now, understood. I understood that you understood, but since you asked the question, I thought I should address <laughs> it for the people who are curious. Okay. So uh, that was Aramenko, and here is his class. Um, so the singular values are uh, basically the critical values. I'm not talking too much today about asymptotic values. Asymptotic values are um, basically omitted values or values that are attained along a curve. If you have a curve going to infinity and an entire function has a limit along that curve, that's an asymptotic value. Um, the Spicer class are entire functions that have only a finite number of singular values. That is what the folding theorem is set up to, to give you, that you only have plus and minus one as singular values. If you want to um, perturb it though, you can use folding to create things that have an, uh, uh, an infinite number of singular values, but they're still inside a bounded region. And that's denoted for the Aramaic, it's called the Aramaic Lubitsch class because they had introduced this and showed a, a, just a huge number of very useful properties of this class. It makes it a, a very nice place to do uh, transcendental dynamics within the uh, Aramaic Lubitsch class. Um, so as I said, the plane folding basically produces things that only have critical values plus and minus one. When we introduce these extra components, we actually get some freedom about putting singular values at other places. So instead of just putting them at plus and minus one, you can actually place singular values other places in, in the disk. And so having this extra freedom lets you create um, 
a bounded singular sets pretty easily. And that's going to occur in some of our, our cases. So first application, a wandering domain. I don't think I have to uh, define what the two and Julia is, sets are. After all, this is Wednesday at a dynamics talk. Um, we actually uh, punished uh, uh, Nuria last week. She came to a conference at Stony Brook. She talked on Thursday, but she still had to define what Fatou and Julia sets were because no one had done that uh, by that point. Uh, she was the first one to, to get to there. Um, but uh, of course, the Fatou set is where the iterates are normal. The Julia sets the complement. A wandering domain is a Fatou component, all of whose orbits are disjoint. So they just keep going forever. And they don't happen uh, often. They don't happen for rational functions by Dennis's result. And that extends to the Spicer class and more generally to finite type maps. On the other hand, entire functions can have wandering domains uh, by result of Baker. Uh, but it was asked, um, could they happen in the Aramaic Lubitsch class? Because they don't happen in the Spicer class. That was known around what around 85, I guess. And uh, one of the things I noticed uh, when I was thinking about uh, Alex's question about the trees, and you know, is every every continuum uh, approximately a true tree? And, and think about the infinite version, one of the first things I noticed was that you could use this to build a wandering domain in this class. And I've given talks about this before and other people ha have done the same thing. Many people in the audience uh, are probably more expert on it than me, but the tree, the picture you draw is this picture. So it basically has these R components. All these unbounded things are just getting mapped uh, to the half plane and then exponentiated as well. And these round components are the D components. And what you can think of is that there's very high order critical points, like maybe z to the 10 here, and z to the 100 here, and z to the 1,000 here, and z to the 10, you know, there, there's very high degree critical points in this thing, but everything is symmetric. So the real line maps to the real line. And so if you start at, say, the point one half, it just iterates to here, and that goes to there, and that goes, and by symmetry, it just stays on the real line forever. But if you start at a point above one half, slightly above it, it follows this, but eventually, I mean, this map is highly expanding. What is this map we're doing? When I draw this picture, what I mean is take the strip and map it to the half plane and then exponentiate that. So with this diagram, when you look at this diagram, what you're supposed to see when you see this picture here, what you're supposed to be imagining is I'm taking that map, I'm mapping it to the half plane, which for a strip is roughly e to the z anyway, and then I'm taking that half plane and I'm exponentiating that or rather applying cosh. That's really the map I'm applying. So this is sort of like e to the e to the z in here. So it's definitely expanding a lot. So point, a little disk here is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger as you move along. And so a point, which is, um, which is just above the real point is going to uh, eventually move away. And once it lands in this point, here I have my z to the 100, the image of that is going to be a little tiny disk because z to the 100 is very contracting. And I have freedom about where to put that disk and I'm going to put it over here, even closer to the point one half that I started on before. So because I'm starting even closer, this orbit is going to follow it for longer. And But eventually the expansion will push it off and then it will come back again and then it will follow for longer and then it will come back. Each time when it comes back, I put it even closer to this real line. So it stays along the real line for a longer time. And so this orbit keeps going around forever. Because every time it hits this disk, it gets compressed a huge amount. Along the entire orbit, it gets compressed. No matter how much expansion there is along the real line, I kill the expansion when it hits the disk. And so overall, if I start with a disk here, that disk gets smaller and smaller, but in a non-monotone way, it gets bigger and bigger, then it gets very small. Then it gets big. So it sort of goes small, it gets bigger, it gets bigger, then it gets very small, then it gets bigger and bigger, and then it gets small. So although it expands for finite segments, in the long run, it goes to zero diameter. And so it's normal. There's a disk around this point, which is in the Fatou component. And if I take a disk around the next orbit, that's also in the Fatou component. But if I take these pairs and I iterate them at some point, one of them lands over here and the one in front of it has gone back to the origin. There's a huge difference. They're very far apart. And not only are they far apart in the Euclidean metric, they're far apart in the hyperbolic metric for the Fatou component. And so we're not having, the Schwartz lemma is violated if they're in the same Fatou component because you know the hyperbolic distances have to go down. And because of this, the, 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 the way the combinatorics work, 
the distances cannot go down. And so the only way out is if they're in different for two components. So every orbit is in a different for two components, so it's wandering, and that's it. And as I said, lots of people have, um, have done this. I should have mentioned uh, uh, David Marty Pete is here. He has a version with uh, Shishikura, who's also here, I think. They actually found a slight mistake in my original uh, paper. It's easy to fix, but uh, really I wanna give them credit for, for pointing that out. And then other people here in the audience have done much more wonderful things with this and shown that you can get all kinds of different uh, properties with, uh, with these maps. But the basic idea that I'm trying to get across here is that you can draw a picture of what you want and then it appears, it exists. So the second application um, was going to be to the dimension of Julia sets. And uh, uh, transcendental Julia sets are, are hard to draw. This is a beautiful picture. I'll show you later on a picture that I tried to draw and it doesn't look this good at all. And, and so um, Arnaud has a, really has some nice, uh, not nice methods. Uh, it's a fractal. Uh, what's its dimension? Uh, I'm interested in Hausdorff dimension and packing dimension. Um, I will give a formal definition on a later slide, but if you don't know it already, Hausdorff dimension is basically how efficiently you can cover, but you're allowed to use squares of different sizes. And in packing dimension, this is related to when you're trying to cover the set by squares all of the same size. That's more restrictive, and so you can be less efficient. And so generally, Hausdorff dimension is less than or equal to packing dimension. Uh, for, for all the sets you love and know, like the middle thirds Cantor set or the Von Koch snowflake, they're always equal. But uh, they can be different in general, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, lots of people have worked on, um, on this. The main thing to keep in mind is a result of Baker that says that for a transcendental function, the Julia set always contains a continuum. There's always a, a non-trivial connected set. And so the dimension is always bigger than one. You can't ever make it smaller than one. Um, and then various people like uh, Ms. Ravich uh, showed, for example, that e to the z, the Julia set is the entire plane. So that's obviously dimension two. And Kurt McMullen uh, gave examples of zero area, uh, but dimension two. Uh, Gwyneth Stallard showed you could get all dimensions between one and two, except one. That's a little bit harder case. Um, her examples were in the Aramaico Lubitsch class. And for that, uh, you can only get strictly bigger than one. That's another theorem. I think the easiest way to understand this is not the words. I, I don't like words, I like pictures. Uh, this is a, a picture of all the possible known dimensions where Hausdorff dimension goes this way and packing dimension goes this way. And packing dimension is always bigger than Hausdorff dimension, bigger than or equal. So that's why we get the upper triangle. Uh, so Miserevich and McMullen, they are this point here. They show that you could get dimension, Hausdorff dimension two. And if you have Hausdorff dimension two, you have to have packing dimension two automatically. Uh, Stallard, Gwyneth got this entire line. She has like the biggest contribution of anyone. She showed all this entire line can, can occur. You can have um, uh, aramaico lubitsch functions that have Hausdorff dimension two for the Julia set, but the packing dimensions all have to be equal to two. So that's either Stallard's theorem or Ripon and Stallard. I'm sorry, my history, I have to go back to the last page to double check that. I guess it's Ripon and Stallard. I don't wanna leave Phil out, okay? Uh, my own contribution was only one dot, it was down here, to show that you could build a, uh, a Julia set of Hausdorff dimension one, and hence it sort of filled in where, 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 where Gwyneth left, left off. Uh, but mine also has packing dimension one. So it's down at this corner. This one we don't know about. We don't know that corner. Um, uh, Jack Burkhardt, in his thesis, basically proves this diagonal exists. It's not... What he actually shows is that given any point on the diagonal, if you draw an epsilon disk around it, there's something in there. There's something whose packing and Hausdorff dimension are close to that. So what he shows is that the diagonal is in the closure of the possible dimensions, but it's still open as to whether his examples are actually on the diagonal or maybe they're slightly off the diagonal. So we don't know. So what you can see is that the picture is mainly still green. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done here. Um, so uh, this is a, an example of uh, how folding gets used. This is the tree that corresponds to a result of uh, myself and Simon Albrecht, where we construct uh, Julia sets where the dimension is almost one. The dimension sort of looks like a one plus epsilon, but we really only get a sequence of things. So in the picture, 
what Simon and I do is that we construct a sequence of, uh, of Spicer class functions that have just three singular values, and that sequence converges down to one, uh, but uh, we, we don't know that everything occurs. So Gwen's examples were in class B and ours are in class C. So it's just an improvement in terms of that. Now, I prepared some slides to basically show you how to prove Gwen's theorem, um, but I'm almost out of time. So what I think I will do is skip over these. Uh, the reason I wanted to do it is because it's pretty uh, uh, simple if you use the model function. Using the model function is just two or three pages of, of, of some calculations and then uh, you, you just have to do the correction map. But that would take me about five minutes and I, I'm not sure I have an extra five minutes. So if someone wants to ask me about this after the talk, there's I think one, two, three, four. So there's five slides basically explaining why the dimension you can get as close to one as you want. But I think I will leave that for um, either to read the paper with Simon or to ask me about. I'm trying to go to the next page, but for some reason it's not. Okay, and so this was my attempt to draw the, uh, the, uh, the Julia set for the model. You can see it's not nearly as clean looking as uh, uh, Sheratot's picture, but uh, I'll have to, I haven't learned the secrets from him as to how to draw the good pictures. I did want to squeeze in uh, one more application, the third uh, thing, and this is the prescribing uh, the post-critical dynamics. So for rational maps, the story is the following. I take a finite set in the plane, and then define some mapping of this set to itself. So you could have a, a point mapping to itself, that's okay, or mapping to a different point or swapping around, you can do this, anything you want, okay? And the point is, can you find a rational map so that these points are the singular values and uh, the mapping of the rational map on the singular points is exactly this. So this is a theorem of DeMarco, uh, uh, Koch and uh, McMullen, that given any picture like this, there's a rational map which has these dynamics, almost. Okay, so by almost, what we mean is that there's a rational mapping whose singular values are the blue dots. And each blue dot is very close to a red dot. And each blue dot maps to the other blue dot, which it should. So if this blue dot is next to this red dot and this red dot goes here, then the blue dot goes to the corresponding blue dot. So the rational map is mimicking uh, the arbitrary dynamics that we wrote down to within epsilon. So we have these epsilon neighborhoods of each thing. And then the rational map is permuting its singular values in. So the rational map has a singular value in each of these neighborhoods, and then it's permuting them in exactly the same way as the arbitrary uh, map uh, did. And uh, so uh, the, the question is, can you take epsilon equal to zero here? And that's, uh, that's open. So it's possible, but that's not proven yet. Okay, so what Kirill did um, a while back was prove this same thing for meromorphic functions, but for infinite sets. And I'm listed as a co-author here, but this is sort of mostly for technical reasons. I made a few uh, improvements and, and suggestions about how to do things and rearrange the proof and so forth. But the core, the main idea, the main argument, I wanna make sure uh, Kirill gets 100% of the credit uh, for that. So, so if you have any discrete set, in the plane, so the only accumulation point is infinity, and you have an arbitrary map uh, from this discrete set to itself, then there's a meromorphic function which mimics that, that you can um, basically define a, a disjoint neighborhoods of all these points and find a meromorphic function which has its singular values in these neighborhoods and which uh, permutes them in the same uh, combinatorial ways the given map. And so you can completely prescribe uh, uh, this. Now again, we don't know you can get exactly correct. We don't know that you can make these neighborhoods epsilon equal to zero. Since we already don't know that for the rational case, it would be pretty surprising if we could prove it in the meromorphic case, but it's open in, in, in both cases. And let me just try to sketch this. If I'm, I've used up my 50 minutes, but would it be okay if I use two or three minutes more to, to finish this? Would people object? Sure, that's fine. that's fine. I guess you always have the option to turn the Zoom off and go have lunch. <laughs> Although I guess it's not lunchtime <laughs> over there. Um, so, sorry, so the idea is um, to take your discrete set and draw a disk around each thing, each of your points, and then connect them by tubes. And in this process, we create this simply connected region, which contains all the points. 
And the points are near the centers of the tubes because if I take the first one and join it to infinity by a hyperbolic geodesic, that hyperbolic geodesic is sort of go, go down the middle of these tubes. And I want the points to be pretty close to that hyperbolic geodesic because if I map this to an upper half plane, by the Riemann mapping theorem, I can map any, um, any simply connected domain to the upper half plane. If I do that, then the picture is gonna become that these things are basically on a vertical line, okay? So the points, the singular points all basically lie in a vertical line. So this picture is the Riemann image in the upper half plane of the picture I had on the previous page. Now I'm gonna use folding in this picture. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create, um, put disks around these points. These are very widely spaced out, by the way. Um, so in the picture with the tubes, the hyperbolic distance between these things is as big as I want. I can make this hyperbolic distance to be a thousand because going through this very narrow tube has large hyperbolic length. And so these things are as spaced out as I want them to be. Um, well, so, and so I can build a QR mapping here by the folding method, which basically has singular values at these points. All of these are treated as R components. So along here, I'm introducing singular values at plus and minus one. I'm going to normalize my infinite discrete set so it contains plus and minus one as subsets. By using a linear map, I can do that. And so all the extra plus and minus ones which are introduced by the folding construction are in the set anyway, so that's fine. Um, at all these other points, I can put these points wherever I want. Remember when I did the deconstruction, I said I can put that singular value anywhere in the unit disk I want. And so I can put these singular values, I can map them to anywhere that I want to in the disk. And by instead of putting a zero in the here, if I put infinity, if I put a pole, I can still do the folding argument with a pole, but now I have the freedom to put those singular values anywhere outside the disk that I want. And so by this method, I take this mapping I build and I put it back into the simply connected domain. And now what I have is a QR map on this, which takes the given set and maps those points exactly as I was given. I was given some data about where they should go to and my QR map does that exactly correctly. And then I just have to fill in the rest of the plane with R components, like I've done here. And I extend, I get a QR map on the whole plane, which has the desired dynamics. So I get a, what we might call a quasi-meromorphic map and it hits exactly with epsilon equal to zero. I get exactly the dynamics that I was given. The trouble is I have to fix it to make it meromorphic. And when I apply the fixing map, when I solve the Beltrami equation, every value gets moved ever so slightly. It gets moved as slightly as I want, but it's no longer true that singular values go to singular values, they miss. This is a terrible problem. And at this point, I probably would have given up and started working on something else because I would not have seen any way to get around this myself. But Kirill saw a way of getting around this. And what, his, uh, what he suggested was, uh, let's take a look at, at, at what happens here. So the black points are the data. So we're given these black points, which I'm now coloring pink. And we're given that we want this pink point to map to this one and this one to go to this pink point. And what I can build is I can build a quasi-regular map that will map the pink point to the pink point. But when I do the correction by phi, the mapping, it moves a little bit. So what happens is, is that there's a yellow point that gets mapped to black and then black gets mapped to the black over here. But then the singular value isn't getting mapped in the right place. I want the yellow to go to the yellow, not yellow go to black. So I'm stuck, what do I do? Well, what Carol suggested is let's make a family of mappings. Let's take, look at the red point here. The red point, we're gonna define a QR mapping, which takes each black point. It's gonna take the black points to a red point, and then the red point moves around. So the red point can vary over this entire disk, okay? As I move the red points around, I get a family of maps. So I sort of get G is parameterized by where this red point is. And for every different choice of a red point, I get a different correction map. I get a different QR map. So I get a different correction map five. So the yellow points are also moving around as well. As I move the red around, the yellows move around. But the yellows, the correction map is as close to the identity as I want. I get to choose it. So the yellow just moves around inside a little epsilon ball. So the red 
is moving around the big blue ball. The yellow is moving around the smaller cyan colored ball. And so now I have a mapping of red to yellow and the range of the yellows is inside the domain of the reds. So I'm mapping a disk to a proper subset of itself. There has to be a fixed point. There has to be some choice of this map in which the black point lands on the red point, but the red point is the same as the yellow, yellow point by the, by the fixed point theorem. The yellow then gets mapped to the black. So the black ends up getting mapped to the black. It works. The singular value maps to the singular value, okay, by the fixed point theorem. And all I need to do is get that fixed point theorem to work on all infinitely many disks at the same time. And that also seems kind of intimidating, but as Kiro pointed out, there are infinite dimensional um, fixed point theorems. And so what you can do is you can take a product, an infinite product of disks, which is compact by, uh, by the Tikhonov theorem. And then there's a version of the, uh, the Brouwer fixed point theorem, which applies to this infinite product of disks. And so what you can do is you can, you can show that there's some choice of the red point in every single one of these disks so that you get everything to line up. The red point maps to the yellow point over here, the yellow point then maps to the black. And so everything works out. You get exactly what you want. And so this is how you prove that all the uh, all possible meromorphic uh, things exist. And so that was, the, uh, that was the last thing I wanted to say. I wanted to thank you uh, for listening and to uh, ask if, uh, if you have any questions. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah. Are there questions or comments? Uh, fantastic talk, thank you. Questions or comments? So the last one. Short question? Yes, go ahead, Mag. Yes, so the go last ahead. one is uh, in Spicer class, right? Um, so this ex last example, no, this is not. Um, uh -huh. So there's, here there are singular values possibly all over the plane. So oh, okay, okay, okay. There, I mean, okay. Our, our singular set is infinite and it's, oh, yeah, it can yeah. be arbitrary. So most likely this will now be nowhere near the, the, the 